<laughs> thank you. All right, so thank you so much for coming. This is my first time in Alaska, and this has been an amazing trip. Uh, this is a really awesome place. This is a really awesome place. And um, I want to thank Linda McGilvery especially, and those at the GI for having me here, for being an amazing host. And you know, I've gotten to go out to Poker Flat and see my first sounding rocket launch. I've seen the big ones. I've spent a lot of time at big launches for NASA, but I've never seen the, the, the little ones. And getting so close to a rocket launch and getting to be part of what's going on behind the scenes was fantastic. Because for the big launches, unless you're part of the mission or you're the NASA administrator or something like that, you don't get to go in the control rooms and see that kind of stuff. So they don't let little folks like me get near all the, the big instruments and the control panels and whatnot. But uh, the other thing is I've also been studying space weather for about 25 or so years. And I did work in New Hampshire, which is where I got my graduate degrees. And I had seen the aurora in the distance, you know, just a glow. But I have not seen the aurora like you all are able to experience here. So I haven't seen it yet, but I will be back. I plan to come back a lot. But I've been studying all this stuff from space. I haven't experienced it from the ground in the way that you do. And that's one of the exciting things about being here is you have a unique access and a unique connection to space weather that most people don't have. Certainly most of Americans have no idea what it's all about. And so I haven't seen it yet. I did see a little bit of Aurora the other night. I was able to pick it up, some of the color with my cell phone, but I couldn't pick out very much. So I'm excited to come back. I'm waiting for the sun to kick it up a little bit, get a little more exciting. But I'm gonna talk about this tonight. I'm gonna to talk about the science of space weather in particular, my perspective, looking at it from space, I'll talk a little bit about it from the ground, but the unique perspective that NASA has, the way we look at it with spacecraft around the Earth, spacecraft through the solar system. And I actually had a different cover slide for my title slide, but the day before I got here, I found out you guys got to see, or at least many of you got to see, a really cool sun dog. And I've seen some, some nice sun dogs, but this is the most amazing one that I've ever seen. Um, and I think that may be the case for some of you. So I don't know if it's turning out very well on this picture. Um, can you see it? Yeah, can we turn the lights down a little bit? I don't know if that's possible. Um, oh, you need them up for the video? Okay. All right, well, if, if you could maybe turn them down just a tad bit. But anyway, this was out from outside the, uh, the uh, university, and it's an amazing, it was an amazing picture. But I want to talk about storms in space, space storms. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of perspective, and I'm going to show you what I think actually is the most amazing image that NASA has ever produced. This is my perspective, but this is, a spot in the sky that you can look at, it's near the, um, the Big Dipper. There's a spot in the sky that if you stare at that spot with a telescope or look at it with your naked eye, you don't see anything. It's completely black, no stars, nothing. But we turned the Hubble Space Telescope to that little patch in the sky, very tiny little piece of the sky, and stared at it for several weeks and collected as much light as we possibly could. And this is what they saw. Every object in this image is a galaxy. And every one of these galaxies has several hundred billion stars. But this was a little tiny, tiny spot in the sky, and there were about 10,000 galaxies in that little tiny spot. So if you extrapolate that to every direction, it turns out that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, each one of those having hundreds of billions of stars. So the point of this is to show you a lot of things. First of all, how incredibly vast the universe is. But 
the key piece of it is all of these, the building blocks for all of these, the building blocks for the galaxies, which are then the building blocks of the universe, are stars. And we live with one right next door, the sun. Super, super close. Um, and it allows us to see this star in an amazing detail. Now, if we look at it from the ground, it's not that exciting, okay? Uh, we may get some really nice effects like the sun dog that you saw, okay, or a, maybe a, a beautiful sunrise or sunset if the clouds in the atmosphere are just right. But for the most part, it's actually too bright. We can't look at it. If we put a basic camera to it, that's as, this is all you're gonna see, okay? Maybe you can put a filter on there, but it's not too exciting. Now, there are unique times when we can see or start to get a feel for how interesting, how dynamic the sun is. Now, one of these is during a total solar eclipse. Okay? And I think, unless you were living under a rock, you knew that we had one in 2017. I certainly tried very hard to make sure everybody knew about it because that was one of my jobs for 2017 for NASA was to help engage the public. And so even if you couldn't go to it, you still had some access to it, some ability to, to experience it. And this is one of the most life-changing things that I've ever experienced. Now, the other one that I want to experience, of course, is seeing the aurora up close. Um, but this is an amazing, amazing thing to, to see. But what you can see here is that when the moon is just at the right location in its orbit and the right orientation, of course, it blocks out the bright sun solar disk, and you can see all of this amazing structure. Um, and all of that starts to give you an indication of how dynamic and interesting the sun is. But to really, really see what's going on, what's happening, and how dynamic it is, what's changing, you have to step outside of our atmosphere. You have to go out into space. Um, from the ground, we can start to get some idea with some of the types of telescopes we can use, but one of the areas is the type of light that we can see the activity um, is not the type of light that we can see with our eyes, but it's also not a type of light that makes it through the atmosphere. That's a good thing because it's things like ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, x-rays or even gamma rays. So we don't really want a lot of those. They're not particularly healthy for us. And the good thing is that there's a lot of atmosphere between us. It stops that light. But it doesn't allow us to see it. But when we put a telescope in space and we look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet light, we get a completely different picture. So you can see all of this stuff happening all the time on all scales from the tiniest little spots on the sun to the whole sun. In fact, you see a flash that occurs right in this area. That's a flash of light. It's actually light coming from all of the electromagnetic spectrum, every type of light from radio waves through the visible light that we can see all the way into x-rays, gamma rays. That's called a solar flare, that really intense flash of light. There's enough energy released in that flash to power the world for 100,000 years. So these are huge, huge explosions, and I'm gonna talk more about that because this is one of these types of space storms. You can also see material moving around here big blobs of solar material that are blasting away. And some of this, some of what you're seeing, is actually what drives aurora, ultimately. When some of this stuff from the sun, some of the material and magnetic field, reaches Earth and interacts with our local environment. Here's the sun that we're most familiar with when we use a telescope with a filter in white light we see it's just this kind of yellow disk. Now, occasionally, you might see these little dark patches called sunspots. 
And in fact, when they're big enough, when they're about this size or bigger, if you have those eclipse glasses, you can actually safely look at the sun and you can see these sunspots on the surface of the sun. So when the sun starts to get more active, you'll be able to pull out those eclipse glasses and look at the sun and see those spots. But if we look at the sun in these other wavelengths of light, the ones that we have to use spacecraft to access, we can see here an ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, all the way close to x-ray. You can see how much different it is, how much more structure. And it depends on which wavelength you look at, you get a completely different view. One of the things this is telling us is that to understand what's going on, but to see the really the big picture, we have to see all these different wavelengths together because they're all telling us something different. One of the things they're telling us, if you look at the surface of the sun in visible light, the surface that we see, called a photosphere, it's about 10,000 degrees. And that's pretty hot. It's a lot hotter than anything around here. But as we start to go to these other wavelengths, the temperature actually starts to go up. And in fact, we're looking at higher and higher layers of the sun's atmosphere. So we go to maybe 15,000 degrees. When we get here, we're up to about 80,000 degrees. By the time we reach right here, we're at several million degrees. And here, at the hottest temperatures are up to 20 to 25 million degrees. And we're at higher and higher layers of the atmosphere, farther and farther away from the visible surface. And it turns out we're looking at the region of the sun that we can see during a total solar eclipse. That region is very faint in visible light. And that's only the reason why we can only see it when we block out the bright disk. But it's extremely bright in these much more energetic wavelengths of light. And it allows us to see all of this dynamics, what's happening and how the sun is changing and how much more complicated it is. Now, if we zoom in, this is one of those wavelengths showing us the sun just shy of a million degrees. But the reason that I want to show you this part is that one of the most important things about the sun is the magnetic field. It turns out the sun is a big magnet, very similar to the Earth. It has a, what we call a dipole structure, which is basically the structure of a bar magnet, you know, a north and a south. And if you've ever taken a bar magnet in a class with, let's say, iron filings, and you put it down near the iron filings, it starts to trace out these kind of loop-like structures. It's allowing you to see the magnetic field, which is normally invisible, because the iron filings will follow the, the magnetic field. Well, the sun does the same thing. So when we look in this wavelength, we're actually seeing these magnetic fields. The, the stuff the sun is made of is actually tracing out these invisible magnetic fields. And it turns out these bright patches are where those dark sunspots are. Sunspots are, in fact, areas of really, really strong magnetic field, hundreds to thousands of times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And these magnetic fields are driving the energy in the sun's atmosphere. So we really want to understand this magnetism, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what's happening is, the whole atmosphere is getting hotter and hotter as we're moving away from it and moving away from the surface of the sun. And that's a weird thing. I mean, if I walk up to a campfire, it's nice and warm, and I start to back away from it, I don't expect it to get hotter. Okay? But that's what's happening in the outer part of the sun's atmosphere, the corona. Okay? And this is a big puzzle. We don't un understand this completely. We're starting to have ideas about it. This has been a problem in solar physics for many years. We don't understand the details, but what we do understand, it's all about the magnetic field, and we all understand that there's energy coming from below being pumped into this outer part of the atmosphere by the magnetic fields. 
And one of the weird things that happens is that that atmosphere continues to heat and something is driving it away from the sun. Something is pushing it, accelerating it out into space, and it creates something called the solar wind. The sun's atmosphere is streaming away constantly, and it fills the whole solar system. And every so often, there's a big gust of that solar wind that's traveling maybe millions of miles an hour, and it can impinge on a planet, it can impinge on a planet's magnetic field, and shake that magnetic field and excite molecules in the atmosphere and we get aurora. So you all have an opportunity when you see the aurora outside to actually see the indirect effect of all this stuff streaming off the sun in the form of the solar wind. But that's just the background stuff that's happening. All of these magnetic fields, as the sun is rotating, get twisted up. Because the sun is not a solid body. The sun is, is what we call a plasma. It's a special kind of gas that's electrified, okay? It has electromagnetic properties and it responds to electricity and magnetism. And when the sun rotates, because it's not a solid body, it's very much like the outer planets, the, the big gaseous planets like Jupiter and Saturn. You see those, those bands around them because it turns out that the equator is moving faster than it is at the North and South Pole. Okay? And so the magnetic fields through the sun are getting dragged along by the rotation of the sun. The magnetic fields near the equator are being dragged faster than the magnetic fields near the North and South Pole. And what that does is it causes the magnetic fields inside the sun to get twisted. Imagine taking a rubber band and you twist that rubber band, eventually it'll start to knot up, okay? And when that happens inside the sun, those knotted magnetic fields become buoyant. They float inside the sun and they pop out the surface. And where they pop out the surface is the sunspots. The sunspots. So those sunspots are where the magnetic fields are popping out the surface. And we can see these loops of magnetic field. And those magnetic fields get twisted and twisted. Just like twisting a rubber band, there's energy. And eventually, if you twist it enough, if you did that to a rubber band, it would pop eventually. Well, the same thing has to happen to these magnetic fields. They have to release this energy. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. I just wanted to show you, this is actually real image data showing you the solar wind streaming away from the sun. So we're using a spacecraft called Stereo, and it actually has incredibly sensitive cameras that allows us to see this constant flow. And you see it's not really super smooth. There's clumpy parts. Um, and this is the stuff that is eventually reaching us and giving us type of aurora. But then, so this is what you have seen. This is actually from not too long ago, recorded nearby here, given to me by Don Hampton. And this is the aurora that you can see just due to the solar wind. This is due to what we call a, a gust of solar wind. This is not the really super dynamic stuff coming off the sun. So I have a slide that I was going to show you that's of really, really humongous sunspots. Back at a time in 2003 called the Halloween storm. So does anybody remember October, November 2003? You guys had a lot of really crazy aurora, right? Okay, this gentleman remembers. There was a time, so I'm not going to put that slide up because it keeps causing it to crash. But what I was going to show you was a picture of the sun in, in white light, visible light, where you can see the sunspots. And all of a sudden, as the sun is rotating around, there's a little small black one, and it gets really big all of a sudden, as big as Jupiter. Okay? So massive sunspot. And it started throwing off all kinds of crazy space weather. So I'm going to skip that. This is a cartoon just to show you. This is what's happening in the magnetic field of the sun. 
So you see it's getting twisted because it's rotating faster and it starts to pop out. And where it's popping out is where the sunspots are. Now this is happening over years. It happens over what's called the solar cycle. The sun goes from very few sunspots when the, the sun's magnetic field is kind of oriented mostly from north to south. And then over about, you know, about a five year period, four and a half year period, there are more and more sunspots and you reach a peak with the most sunspots. We call that solar maximum. And then it sheds that energy and the, the sun goes back to a quiet state again, solar minimum. This takes roughly 11 years. Okay. Right now we're close to solar minimum. There are very few sunspots. There's very little activity. And here's another cartoon to show you what's happening. So you see where the sunspots are where those magnetic field lines are poking out. They're coming up from underneath. They poke through the visible surface and where they do, they're cooler, they suppress the heat, they make it darker looking, and that's why you get these dark patches, the sunspots. And eventually, they build up energy, and bam, they violently release energy. There's a flash of light, we call that the solar flare, but it also throws out billions of tons of solar material and magnetic field. Those are called coronal mass ejections. And both, the solar flare and the coronal mass ejection create huge shock waves. And those shock waves accelerate particles, electrons and protons, the fundamental particles in atoms, to speeds near the speed of light. So I'm going to show you real data now of what's happened. I wanted to show you the sunspot, but that keeps causing it to crash. So I'm going to skip that one. But now I'm looking at the same period, but I'm going to be looking at it in extreme ultraviolet, in that high energy light, okay? This is a period at the end of October 2003. Okay, so you see, this is where the sunspots are. All of a sudden, these big sunspots start appearing. And look, you keep seeing all these little flashes, okay? And occasionally, you see stuff popping off, going out into space. This was two weeks of incredibly intense solar activity. Now eventually, you see all that snow, okay? Those are those particles. Those high energy particles that are accelerated by those massive shocks are hitting the camera and they're passing through the camera and they're leaving those streaks in that snow. Now what I'm going to do now is show you the same event, but I'm going to zoom out. And I'm going to zoom out with something called a coronagraph. And what we do with a coronagraph is we create an artificial eclipse. I'm going to block out the bright sun, the disk of the sun, just like the moon does, by simply putting something in front of the sun, in front of my camera, now I'm going to superimpose this on the image, but that's, that's not really what we're doing. We're really just trying to look at the white light. And then I'm going to create an eclipse. So what you're going to do now is you're going to see stuff coming out from the sun. So let me move to the next one. Okay. So there's the image before superimposed on it, but you see those big blobs of stuff coming out. Those are those coronal mass ejections billions of tons of material. And then you see the camera is completely swamped by all those particles hitting it. Okay. That's actually a planet right there. Every so often you'll see something fly in. That's a comet actually flying into the sun. Okay. But this is the artificial eclipse we created. Now, just to tell you why do we do this? Why don't we do this all the time? Because I'm talking about seeing solar eclipses from the ground. The caveat is we can't do it as well as the moon can. This, this artificial eclipse is not as good as the moon. The quality that's created by the moon, earth, sun system is much better. But we can do a decent job that allows us to see these events. So you see this started in the end, no, end of October and went to November 7th. Some of the largest space weather events ever recorded in modern times and some of the largest ones 
that we know of period occurred during this two week period. Okay. So what happened during those two weeks? Okay, well, there's some people here that raised their hand that actually saw some aurora. Okay. Fairbanks, Anchorage. Now, what I don't have here are pictures of the aurora that were seen in Florida. But aurora was seen in Florida. So, more than 20 spacecraft satellites were impacted. One Japanese satellite was lost. We don't even know how many military satellites were impacted because they won't tell us that. Okay? But we know that that happened. Um, there were severe radio, high frequency radio blackouts. Okay? Um, this was the first time the FAA ever issued a radiation warning. There were power, power failures in Sweden. There were also power failures in South Africa. Um, there were some climbers in the Himalaya that lost their, their satellite phone connections. Um, we had to temporarily shut down the navigation system, Loran system, used by the Coast Guard. Um, and Mars Odyssey had a radiation detector on it, and it was knocked out by the radiation that reached Mars. Okay. Um, and we also know that some of the Martian atmosphere was permanently blasted out in the space. So this is just a small list of the things that happened during those Halloween storms, we call them, in 2003. Now, data has evolved a lot. We have much better data. And in fact, the next solar cycle, so that was near the last solar maximum. And two, last solar maximum was about 2001. So that was the trail in that was just coming off the peak in 2003. The next solar maximum was between the period of 2012, 13, and 14. Okay. Um, so here is some space weather that happened. So you, some of you may have been around in March 2012. Do you remember any strong aurora in the beginning of March in 2012? Okay. Um, this is a more recent spacecraft called SDO. So you can see there's the flash, the solar flare, and then you see these wiggles. That's actually a giant wave traveling across the sun at several million miles an hour. And it shot billions of tons of material out into space. And we used the chronograph again to look at that. So. You see, here are the particles. Now, this was a big space weather event, but this was orders of magnitude smaller than what happened in 2003. But this still was a significant event. And this is a zoom in of some of the aurora that were seen during that time. Okay. So, stepping back to remind you so there's this constant flow coming out of the sun the solar wind okay and it occasionally has bursts where it's a little bit faster so you think of it sort of as the background ocean in the solar system and then when the sun is really active we have these eruptions happening on top of that we have the flash the solar flare and then the material that's pushed out called the coronal mass ejection, or CME. NASA loves to have uh, abbreviated things and use acronyms. Um, and then we have the particles. So here are the different parts of space storms, of, so, of space weather, to give you some, some timing also. So you have the flash of light. That's the solar flare. And that takes eight minutes to get here. That's the light time. That's how fast light travels from the Earth to the sun. So when we see the solar flare, it's here, okay? Because we have a camera, we're measuring light. When that camera records that light, that means the solar flare is here. Now, the coronal mass ejection is actually the slowest of the three. That takes, it's traveling at a piddly little million miles or seven million miles an hour compared to the speed of light. That's actually really slow. So that takes somewhere between 16, 17 hours for the fastest events to down to around three days, okay, for a slower event. And then in between, 
are these particles. In particular, we're most interested in protons. These are heavier particles. They're bigger particles. Um, and they're accelerated to close to the speed of light, so they take somewhere between 15 minutes to about 60 minutes. Now, you saw on the camera when the snow hit. So there was a flash, stuff blew out, and then you saw the snow. That's those particles hitting the camera. That's when they're getting to us. The CME that you saw in the camera, the big puff of smoke coming out the side, we see that at a distance. We're seeing light reflected off of it. So it's not here yet. It's just left the sun. But you can see how big they are because the sun was actually just about this big in that image and then there was this giant cloud. They quickly expand to the size of the whole inner solar system. So they impact everything. And then here is a visualization showing you there's the solar wind and now all of a sudden here comes the CME. It's like a giant wave riding on the background of the ocean. Okay? And here's the crazy thing. This, that solar wind that's streaming off the sun, that's the atmosphere of the sun. That's filling the solar system. And what that means is we're actually living in the atmosphere of the sun. We live in the extended atmosphere of a star. I think that's pretty crazy. Um, and when all of that stuff reaches Earth, it impacts our magnetic field. And it jostles the magnetic field. So I'm going to show you now a computer model, but it's based on real data of what happens when one of these big storms hits the magnetic field. Now the Sun, the Earth's magnetic field is basically a bar magnet, so that means the magnetic fields come out the north and south pole, but it's a little bit different because of all these streaming particles coming away from it, the magnetic field of the Earth is actually stretched away from the Sun. And it creates kind of a teardrop drop shape, or like a tadpole shape. So if the Sun is over here, things are flowing off of it, it's going to pull the magnetic field back and make it this sort of elongated structure. We call that the magnetosphere. I'll show you a computer model of what that looks like. So, you see that up close you have the magnetic field that just comes out like this, a north and south part. In this case, the sun is in this direction. There's a huge explosion, and you're seeing it hit the earth, and when it does, it pulls the magnetic field. It drags it back, and it pushes it. It pushes it down close to the earth. So, one of the things to think about is normally a spacecraft would be right here inside the magnetic field but then a spacecraft when this coronal mass ejection hits it it's all of a sudden outside of it so this is one of the things that's a, that causes problems for spacecraft they're sitting inside the protective magnetic field but when this giant thing slams into it and squishes the magnetic field all of a sudden the spacecraft is sitting outside of it but what's happening is, you see how violently the magnetic field has changed, how much it's shaken. And you can think of it like being hit, rung, like a bell being rung, okay? It's, it's jostled. And when you have a magnetic field, and you move a magnetic field very quickly, it generates electrical current. And electrical current is generated in the upper atmosphere, in particular a layer we call the ionosphere, and sometimes, if those currents are strong enough, they're induced on the ground. When you have magnetic fields and you have currents that are generated, if you have a nearby wire, a conductor, it can pick up that current. Well, where, where would you have a large conductor on the ground? Okay, a long conductor. Two main places. One, power lines. Okay, if you have a long power line between, let's say, the substation and your house, you're going to have a really, you know, you could have power lines that are several miles long. Okay, that's a long conductor. But you guys also have another one that's very unique. Pipelines, exactly. It's another place where these currents are picked up. Okay, so when these storms are, 
strong enough, they can actually induce currents on the ground. And in fact, they induce currents in the ground all the time. But when they're really strong, they actually induce them in the power grids. And the power grids can't handle that sudden surge of energy. And two things can happen. They can either trip a circuit, like a fuse, or they can continually hit the transformer and heat it up. And that's the more dangerous thing because then the transformer actually melts. And we've seen that happen. Very famous event in 1989 happened. Extremely strong solar eruption and it impacted all of North America, but especially Quebec. Quebec hydro uh, power system went down. So many millions of people lost power for several hours. And we've got pictures of the transformers and you can see them actually, some of them are melted. It's pretty crazy. So let's, I wanna have more time for questions. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit. Um, I did wanna show you another animation just to kind of give you an idea. So this is kind of what's happening. When that big system, the magnetosphere is hit, energy in the magnetosphere is channeled into the poles. Okay, the magnetic fields go into the north and south. So that's why we have the auroral ovals because the energy goes into where the magnetic fields come together. And we get the auroral oval that you see, okay? The energy is flowing into the north and south pole. If we could see particles with our eyes, which we can't, but if we could do that, what would it look like around the Earth? Because we look out at, these, at space and we think of space as being very empty, okay? Besides what we see between things like the planets and the stars, we think of space as being very black and very empty. But it's actually full of these particles and electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields. So this is a physics-driven computer model showing you all of these particles that are streaming around the magnetic fields of the Earth. So this is the environment around the Earth. And the, the bigger picture about all this is all of this stuff coming off the sun, especially the material and the magnetic fields is electromagnetic in nature, okay? And what is electromagnetic in nature? Technology, okay? So all of this is impacting our technology. In particular, in the strongest cases, it impacts technology on the ground, but, but more generally, it's impacting the technology that we put into space. It impacts our ability to communicate through the atmosphere. It disrupts the atmosphere, um, disrupting our ability to bounce radio signals off of it or send radio signals through it, depending on the, kind, the frequency. That disrupts GPS, causes problems with the accuracy of GPS. And also, a lot of this energy, these particles, can knock out satellites. You saw those particles passing through the cameras, all that snow. Well, that's particles, high energy particles that are passing through solid state, through solid state material. And for example, if you have a spacecraft and a particle passes through it, our current electronics are based on the idea of zeros and ones, binary. And sometimes those particles, when they pass through it, they can do what we call a bit flip they change a zero into a one, or a one into a zero. And when you've got instructions in a satellite telling it to, you know, look this way, turn on, turn off, it's not so good when all of a sudden the instructions are changing because of these particles passing through it, okay? It can disrupt the memory, um, it can cause all kinds of problems. But the other part is we have people up there, okay? We are very well protected by the atmosphere above us from all of these particles, from this energetic light. That's not the case if you're sitting in the ISS or you're planning on eventually taking a trip to the moon or maybe even beyond. You're now much more exposed. So all of this stuff that's coming from the sun is impacting our technology 
And we're becoming more and more technologically sophisticated and relying more and more on technology for our daily lives. So we need to understand this phenomena. We need to be able to ultimately predict it. Just like we predict weather here on Earth. We do an okay job. We're, you know, depending on where you are, it's not always the best. But we do have a pretty good ability to track hurricanes, um, to understand what's happening. That's where we would like to be with space weather. But it's a little bit more challenging. The solar system's a big place. The sun is big. We're still trying to better understand it and when it's going to release this kind of phenomenon. And then as it's traveling through the solar system, we're not just interested now in what's happening on Earth. As we take people out into space, we want to understand the environment because you can see it's pretty crazy. But we already have things in space outside of the Earth. We have spacecraft at Mars. We have rovers on the planet. We have spacecraft orbiting the sun. We now have spacecraft at the very edge of our solar system, like the Voyager spacecraft. Okay. So it's a big, big place. And we're trying to figure out what's happening, not just here, but everywhere in between. Because all of this stuff interacts with everything in the solar system, with other planets, with their magnetic fields, if they have them, with their atmospheres. It interacts with comets, asteroids, and it's going to impact and continue to impact the things that we put in the space. But beyond that, what's happening on our sun and how it interacts with the planets in our solar system tells us about what's happening at other solar systems outside of our own. We're now learning about what's happening in extrasolar planets by understanding what's happening here. For example, you may remember that when we talked about what happened in 2003 that we know that part of the Martian atmosphere was blown out into space. Well, it turns out billions of years ago, Mars might have been a habitable planet and had oceans with liquid water and a thicker atmosphere. We have a spacecraft around Mars now called MAVEN, which is studying the atmosphere and the interaction of the sun and space weather with it. And we realize that billions of years ago, Mars, which is a much smaller planet, we think had a global magnetic field like the Earth. But one day it just turned off. The core cooled and it no longer had a global magnetic field. But what that meant is over the next billions of years, being bombarded by all this stuff on the sun, that magnetic field was what allowed that atmosphere to stay intact. And it was no longer there, so it was stripped away by erosion from the sun and from space weather over billions of years. And now we have the Mars we have today. So what we're learning about that kind of interaction is telling us about what's happening in other solar systems, in other extrasolar systems. Because we know now there are thousands of them. We've already found more than 4,000 extrasolar planets. And we have a new mission called TESS, which is going to find tens of thousands of extrasolar planets. So um, it's a pretty exciting field. And it's important for our daily lives. It's important for our sophisticated technologies and our expanding society. But it's also telling us about how we got here. Because it's telling us about the evolution of our solar system. And that tells us about the evolution of life. And it's going to tell us about the possibility of life outside of our own planet and eventually outside of our own solar system. Now, I want to give you guys some time to answer, to ask me questions, so I'm going to skip ahead. I do want to mention two really cool things that are happening. So in August of 2018, we launched a spacecraft called Parker Solar Probe. Okay, We sent a spacecraft to the sun. It's now orbiting the sun, getting closer and closer, and 
On its closest approach in 2024, after it finishes 24 orbits, it's actually going to be less than 4 million miles from what we call the photosphere, the visible surface. To give you an idea of how close that is, the football field here, there's the sun at one end and Earth at the other. And some of the objects that you know, Mercury is at about 35-yard line. Venus is at Earth's 28-yard line. The structures that we're interested in understanding are at about the 15-yard line, where the solar wind is forming and going out into space. So the closest we had gotten before was at about the 29-yard line with the Helio spacecraft. Parker Solar Probe is going to make it to the sun's four-yard line. Okay. So it's going to get close. And then next week, we're launching yet another one called Solar Orbiter. And Solar Orbiter is not going to get as close as Parker, but Solar Orbiter is actually going to have an orbit that is like this compared to the plane. So it's going to be looking down on the poles of the sun, the North and South Pole, because we don't understand those very well because we can't see them very well. So that's going to be launching on February 7th, if everything works out OK. Um, and give us, in combination with Parker, a completely new perspective of the sun to understand the details and the physics of why it's doing what it's doing and our, how it interacts in, in drives the system that we live in, in the solar system. Uh, I'll end with this. Last year, we had another total solar eclipse in Argentina, and we did a GoPro camera. I'm one of the little people moving around over here. Um, but uh, this is what it looked like. You could actually see the shadow. Okay? It's, it was pretty amazing, because this is happening near sunset, too. And because it was happening near sunset, it was very low in the sky, so the eclipse was happening through a lot of atmosphere. And what that meant is we had something called shadow bands. Okay? I don't know if you've ever heard of shadow bands, but if you think about, if you've ever looked in a pool and you see the light shining in the pool and there's reflective patterns you see on the bottom of the pool, okay? Those are something similar to what happens when the eclipse shines through the atmosphere of the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth, when it's thick enough, is like a pool. And it creates these ripples. So I'm standing there, looking at the eclipse. There's a mountain behind me. And I hear somebody scream, oh my god, look at the shadow bands. And so we look behind us, because normally, shadow bands, when you're looking at an eclipse from high above, they're going to be at your feet, because the, the, the sun is shining this way during the eclipse. And you usually have to have white sheets or something out. They're very, very hard to see. So this is what they look like on a mountain. Holy sh Do you see all that in the background? I think that was me screaming. But, um, it was pretty amazing. So that's kind of an overview, Space Weather 101, hopefully to give you guys uh, uh, an idea of what's happening. And I hope that. Next time you look up in the, in the sky and you see a little star, okay, just remember that it looks like that crazy big ball of all kinds of stuff happening. And then when you look up in the sky and you see aurora, and I'm infinitely jealous of you guys that you're going to get to do this on a regular basis, this is what's driving that. Okay? All of this stuff coming off the sun is driving that and giving you a unique connection to space weather, something that most people don't get. This is the first manifestation that we can see of what's happening with space weather. So thank you very much.